Good afternoon, everyone. Apologies for being ever so slightly late. Um, these things happen when I get distracted just before class begins. Um, so I will try not to do that too often, but it does happen on occasion. Um, and just so everybody's ready when we go back to in-person classes, does everybody know the rule for the determining how long you're supposed to wait for somebody who's late to a meeting? If it's a if it's a professional or a school meeting, this is an unofficial rule, but it's a pretty good rule of thumb to live by. So if it's in a professional meeting, um, the rule is five minutes for courtesy and then five minutes for every degree that the person you're waiting for has that you don't. So, uh, depending on who you're waiting for, you might be waiting a different amount of time, but that's a pretty good way of determining whether or not uh, you should you can go ahead and leave or stick around. Um, and that also gives rise to the common rule of thumb for college classes that it's either 15 or 20 minutes, depending on what, what school you're going to or who you ask. Um, it's not an official rule. Technically, you're supposed to be there the whole time, but then again, technically, I would I'm supposed to be there too. So um, if you went ahead and left, nobody's really in the wrong except the instructor who didn't show up. Um, anyway, let's uh, let me go ahead and bring up slides and we'll start with slides. Um, so you guys asked a lot of really good questions today or uh, over the weekend um, regarding um, how to count electrons. Um, how charge works, various other things related to the material, and we'll go over some of those here in a second. Um, but I did want to show a few of my favorite um, questions that you guys asked that were not related to the stuff we're covering right now. Um, is there a chemical sequence for the compound of beer? Well, it turns out beer is actually a lot of different compounds, and if you um, if you want to analyze all of them, there's actually a, I think I've referenced this um, page before, Compound Chemistry is the name of a, of a graphic design artist who also happens to teach chemistry. Um, and he did a cool infographic sort of um, poster about some of the different processes that happen when you're making beer and different kinds of compounds you find in beer. Um, for instance, alpha acids versus beta acids, alpha acids, are, Alpha acids are what give beer its bitterness, but the beta acids give a lot of the other flavors in beer. So whether some a beer tastes has like citrus notes or um, tastes herbal or tastes um, you know like mango, a lot of that um, can be found in these beta acids and in these esters. Um, for instance, you can make a wheat beer if you make a traditional um, Bavarian. Hefeweizen, then um, depending on what temperature you ferment it at, the yeast will produce a different ester. And you can actually make it taste a little bit like and smell a little bit like it has cloves in it if you ferment at one temperature, or banana if you ferment at a different temperature. Um, so there's a lot of stuff going on in beer that makes it really, really fascinating from a chemistry point of view. Um, and the average beer in general is going to have about 800 different compounds in it. That are produced by the malted barley you started with, that are produced by the hops that you put in it, or that are produced by the um, the yeast as it ferments, plus of course water. Um, so there is no one single compound that you could say is is beer. Um, it really has to be a com a, a combination of all of these. And interestingly enough, um, beer is responsible for the oldest recorded um, food safety law. Um, in in uh, Germany, in the I want to say it was in like the 1400s or so, um, there was a shortage of wheat um, when it came to making bread for everybody to survive through the winter. Everybody needed bread to live, um, and but at the same time, wheat beers and rye beers were really really popular among Germans at the time. Um, and so the king of Germany at the time, I think it was a king. Um, I actually had to make a decree that said beer by definition can only be made with malted barley, hops, and water um, because they didn't even understand what yeast was at the time. So beer by definition could only have three ingredients. Um, and that was 
less about the ensuring the quality and beer and more about making sure there was enough rye to make bread so that people didn't starve to death. Um, so they uh, and they called that the Reinheitsgebot, which is German for G beer purity law, German beer purity law, I think. Um, so just interesting historical side note as well. Fascinating. Hey, Sean, have you ever brewed beer with um, mugwort? I have not too. used mugwort. I'm kind of a traditionalist. Most of the beer that I used to brew was was predominantly just barley and uh, grains. Um, although I did make a really, really good coffee stout. Um, I called it a breakfast stout because it was it had oatmeal and coffee and uh, lactose, milk sugar in it. So it was like getting a, a balanced breakfast all in one beer. Um, I'll have to look into mugwort. That's an interesting idea. Yeah. Um, let's, go ahead. Sorry. It's called mugwort because it was one of the traditional herbs for brewing beer before hops. Yeah, so hops are actually fairly recent discovery mm -hmm. um, in, front, in historical sense. So before they had hops, they used all sorts of any bitter herb. Um, and actually some of the oldest samples of beer that, um, that they found um, archeologically were from the Isle of Skye in Scotland. And they found these stone barrels that had a residue at the bottom. And they figured out that they actually bittered their beer with nightshade and hemlock, um, one of which is a stimulant and one of which is a hallucinogen. Um, so we can uh, infer that those ancient Scots and Vikings uh, like to have a good time, um, yeah. although they eventually moved it using more safer um, herbs for uh, bittering. But early American beers actually used spruce tips. Um, because they couldn't get on the upper in the uh, northeast, they didn't have access to hops. So they use spruce tips um, to bitter their beer. And spruce beer, they still make it sometimes. It tastes kind of awful, if you ask me. Um, but then again, I don't like the smell of pine and herbal stuff in general. Anyway, let's moving on to, I'll save some of these for next time. Um, that will answer two others of these. We'll talk about, are there any other specific elements that can be in the form of plasma? And so we haven't really talked about plasma as a phase yet, um, because generally when we're talking about phases of material, we're talking about solids, liquids, and gases. However, if you get up above a certain temperature and pressure combination, so this is what's called a, a um, phase diagram where you've got pressure of the system on the y-axis and temperature on the x-axis. And so you can basically draw lines that represent when you, when you go from one phase to a different phase. So for instance, this line right here um, is the, the phase transition between solid and liquid. So when something goes from solid, if you start at one atmosphere of pressure, and below this temperature, as you increase the temperature, you'll hit a point where it melts. And if you keep increasing the pressure, the uh, temperature at the same pressure, you hit a point where it boils. So every substance has a diagram like this, um, where, where it kind of describes where all the different phase transitions are and what kind of phase transitions you can have at certain, con uh, certain um, conditions. So this would be the phase diagram for water. Phase diagram for CO2 is going to look significantly different than this. They'll have the same general shape, but the, the different the numbers will all be very different depending on what the boiling point is, what the melting point is, et cetera. Um, but this point up at the top of the liquid gas line, actually, this liquid gas transition actually ends at a point they call the critical point. If you get to a higher temperature and pressure than the critical point, you actually don't have a liquid or a gas you have what's called supercritical fluid, um, which one of the common names for that is uh, plasma. Technically plasma means is a little bit different, but um, in common usage, basically what, what you have there is all of your atoms have enough energy to be in the gas phase, but they don't have enough space to be in the gas phase. So they're stuck closer together like it's a liquid, even though they're moving so fast that they should be able to turn into a gas. Um, so every substance can become a plasma, and plasmas wind up having certain um, very distinct properties. So um, the, the sun, for instance, is not actually a gas. It's not a ball of gas. It's actually a ball of plasma because of the, the pressure and the gravity pulling all of that 
mass into the middle is so great that you actually have this supercritical fluid instead of having a true gas. Um, so the question was, are there only specific elements? Absolutely not. Just like every compound can be in liquid, solid, or gas, depending on, on the conditions, every substance can also go to that fourth phase, that supercritical fluid phase, um, if it's hot enough, if the um, pressure is high enough. Oh, and yes, thank you, Brooke. I will go ahead and do that. I saved them earlier. Um, just take me one second since I'm already right here. It looks like I didn't fully get rid of some of the links from last year, so I'll clean this up later after class, um, but get the slides posted real quick. I wonder if I could ask a question while you're doing that. Um, yeah. Looking at the periodic table and uh, noticing there's like darker lines outlining parts of it, what do those indicate exactly? So good question. Let me pull up my... Um, periodic table as well, so I can zoom in on it and ask, because we will we will talk about the periodic table. You know what, why don't you hang on to that thought? We're gonna talk about I the periodic wait. table later today. Um, and that'll be more, um, more appropriate then. Uh, last but not least, since um, somebody asked about this, I already have this saved and if, just take a second. Um, what's my favorite what if question from that book, a what if? And what's your favorite piece of useless trivia? Well, today those happen to be the same answer. If you look at their, the page on orbital speed, which talks about re, um, spacecraft re-entering and what would happen if you change the speed certain ways. Uh, at the very end, it has a little blurb. It says, um, this, the length of the song, I'm gonna be by the Proclaimers. Um, the, I would walk 500 miles and I would walk 500 more. Um, the length of that song is three minutes and 30 seconds. And at the speed the International Space Station is traveling, if you sat and you listened to that song, at the, by the time you finished the first beat of that song and the last line of that song, you will have traveled almost exactly a thousand miles, um, which is a really funny coincidence and happens to be a fun piece of random useless trivia. So we will go ahead and get to more useful trivia now. Um, a lot of you guys, um, a lot of you folks were fairly concerned about whether or not you were counting electrons properly, um, which I get. That's totally normal. And we're going to spend a lot of time on electrons specifically today. And you should feel much better by the end of today. But um, the, the specific answer to some of these questions such as how exactly do we count electrons and is it protons minus electrons to figure out the charge? Um, these are all related. So remember that anything that has a positive charge comes from a proton. So your total positive charge is gonna be all of your protons put together. And your total negative charge is all of your electrons put together. So if you wanna know what the net charge is, the the overall charge on an atom, it's just going to be protons, protons minus electrons. Because remember, your electrons are negative. So if you take the number of protons minus the number of electrons, if you have extra electrons, you'll get a negative charge. If you have extra protons, you'll get a positive charge. Right? So there is a formula to it. I, I like to think about it less in terms of a formula and more in terms of you just add up all the things that are positive and then you add all the things that are negative. And the sum of those two charges will be your overall charge. But for a lot of people, it's helpful to have a specific formula, um, which would just be number of protons minus number of electrons will give you the overall charge for an atom or for a molecule. Um, also, a lot of people were asking questions about the difference between why did I write ion at the beginning or on the key versus atom. Um, if something any has any charge whatsoever, it's an ion. So cation and anion that were brought up in the lab are just specifics. There's a subset of ions. Anything with a charge is an ion. Anything with a positive charge is a cation. 
And I always remember that because the T in cat looks like a plus. So if it's a cation, it has a positive charge and a neg and anion, you can think of AN at the beginning as standing for a negative ion. Anion is a negative ion. So anything that has an overall charge though is an ion. And if you wanna specify that something is neutral, you, either, you would just say atom. So if I say an iron atom, that means that it's got a charge of zero. If I say an iron ion, that means that it has a charge. Did the, I think the slides got, I hit save on that, right? So slides are all good now. All right, I'm not hearing any uproar saying the slides are not posted yet. So I will assume that the slides are good. <clears throat> Everybody can see them. Cody, did you have a question? No, I'm good, sorry. Uh, no worries. Uh, I'm never sure, quite sure if somebody's unmuting on accident or because they have a question and they're just waiting politely for me to stop talking. So uh, feel free to interrupt if I don't stop talking when you're waiting to ask a question. Um, we're going to talk about atomic number increasing as atomic mass increases as we, when we talk about the periodic table later today. So I'm going to leave this one for now. Um, and then last but not least, does the charge change the element a little, or does each element automatically have a certain charge? Again, we're going to talk about the periodic table and how we can interpret the shape of the periodic table to, to sort of predict what the charge, um, stable charges on an um, element will be. Um, and the charge changes how an atom will, will act, how it responds to magnetic fields, how it sticks to other charges, but it doesn't change what element it is. So it changes the behavior of an atom depending on what the charge is, but it doesn't necessarily change what the element is. Um, I thought that was a good way of phrasing. A lot of you asked questions about what does the charge mean? Why do we care about the charge? Um, because you know, iron, iron when it's metal has different properties than iron when it's, when it's um, got a charge. So understanding what the charges can be and how that affects certain properties winds up being kind of important. And we'll get to all that. Uh, as we talk about the periodic table. All right, recap where we ended last week. Um, we started, we were talking about substances and whether something was a pure substance or not. Um, and it, remember, it came down to if the atoms are always combined the same way, then we called it a pure substance, meaning um, if Every atom, if you pick, had a sample of aluminum metal, every atom that you pick is going to be identical to every other atom. Every atom is connected to all the other atoms in the same way. In other words, it's completely uniform. There's no difference between atom, an atom over here on the right and an atom over there on the left. They're going to be identical atoms and connected the same way. And the same for water molecules. If you had a something that was not a single element, if you looked at a compound, um, every atom, every oxygen atom in pure water is identical to every other oxygen atom. There, if I picked an oxygen atom at random, I would not be able to tell it apart from any other oxygen atom in that water sample. Because if it's a pure substance, every molecule, every, every specific type of atom is connected to the rest of the atoms the same way. Uh, and so one of the ways that we can see that is that the with compounds, they're, they're made from multiple elements. But if you broke it down into the individual number of each type of element, there's always the same ratio. So for a sample of pure water, it doesn't matter how much water I have, I'm always going to wind up with twice as many hydrogen atoms as oxygen atoms. It's always going to be that two to one ratio. And if I had pure hydrogen peroxide, it's always going to be one to one oxygen to hydrogen ratio, no matter how much of it I have. And same for sodium chloride. For sodium chloride, for a salt, you have the, the same number of 
sodium ions as chloride ions. There's not any difference between any one particular, every chloride ion is going to behave the same way. And it's going to be connected to sodium atoms in the same way as every other chloride. All right, so mixtures is what we ended with. We said that a mixture is anything else, anything that where you can have a variable ratio of elements or where you can add more of a specific element. Um, so metals, a lot of metal alloys. An alloy is just a specific um, term used in metallurgy to describe a mixture of elements. So different alloys are different mixtures because you can add in various amounts if you want to make stainless steel versus surgical steel versus the steel that they use for I-beams um, in construction. You're just going to mix slightly different amounts of all the same various elements together to give you those different properties. So the fact that you can mix them together in different ratios tells us that steel is a mixture. Um, and usually that means that they we can separate the components physically, meaning that they're not bound together necessarily. That's kind of tricky with something like a metal um, mixture. But with things like gases, we can separate the water out of our atmosphere. If we have a sample of, of atmospheric gas, we can there are ways we can separate the water molecules out or we can separate the oxygen atoms out. Um, that's how we get oxygen in in um, oxygen tanks usually is you start from atmospheric gas and you, you process it so that you wind up separating the gases by how large they are. And you can wind up getting just the oxygen groups together that way. So that's, um, that's one of the, the ways to determine if something is a mixture or not, or if it's a pure substance is, can you easily separate the pieces? So you can't easily separate the hydrogen from oxygen in water. If you've got water, you can't really separate it into its constituent elements easily. But if you have salt water, you can separate the salt from the water pretty easily by just letting the water evaporate and the salt's left behind. So that'd be an example of one of the ways we can physically separate those components. Uh, and mixing oil and water. Anytime you're pouring two things together, you're almost always going to be making a mixture. All right, so getting into the newer terminology, the last distinction we're going to make is within mixtures, there are actually two types of mixtures. So we had two types of pure, if we think of all matter as being a flow chart, um, if it's if it's a pure substance, then it's either an element or a compound. If it's a mixture, it's either going to be a heterogeneous mixture or a homogeneous mixture are the two ways we describe that. And so with, within all mixtures are going to fall into one of these two categories, although it can be something more like a spectrum rather than a binary. It's either heterogeneous or, or homogeneous because depending on exactly what scale you're talking about, how well mixed something is at any given moment, something can, a mixture can go from being heterogeneous to homogeneous. Um, if you think about uh, getting a bottle of salad dressing from the refrigerator that's separated into two layers, and then you shake it up, you're taking it from being heterogeneous, where things are unevenly mixed, to homogeneous, where it's more or less uh, uniform. Right, so it's easy to think about these as being two separate categories, but it also is one of those one of those these vocab terms where, depending on how much I feel like splitting hairs, um, and how much I feel like arguing um, with somebody, I could I could make the argument for almost anything be, being heterogeneous um, because the atmospheric, you know, for if you look at the atmosphere, the atmosphere seems like it should be homogeneous. But if you take a sample of air from sea level versus a sample of air from the top of Mount Everest, they're going to have slightly different concentrations of various gases. And that difference in concentrations is you could make the argument that our atmosphere is heterogeneous when it seems very well mixed. <clears throat> 
right? So, but in general, your classic example of what heterogeneous means or a heterogeneous mixture would be something like oil and water, where you still have two distinct phases. You can mix it up, but it'll wind up separating itself back out. Um, and so it's still a mixture because you have both oil and water in your system, but they're not evenly dispersed. Right, where it's it does not have a uniform composition. Um, if you look at something like an alloy, like brass, brass is going to be more or less homogeneous because you have to have the copper and the zinc mixed in the right ratio and mixed thoroughly so that it makes one continuous um, metal composition throughout. Um, but something that was like gold plated, for instance, would be heterogeneous because you would have gold on the outside and some cheaper metal on the inside. If it was still one object, you could say well, that would be a mixture, but it would not be a homogeneous mixture, It'd be a heterogeneous mixture. Um, wet sand, everybody, I can also tell by the number of questions I got about sunburn and sunscreen that everybody's enjoying being outside um, now that the weather's warming up. Um, wet sand is another good example of a heterogeneous mixture, right? Because depending on where you scoop your water from the top of the lake or the bottom of the lake, you're getting, you are going to get a different amount of sand mixed in with your water, right? A cup of tea is kind of an interesting one. Would that be homogeneous? If you put sugar in tea, is that going to be homogeneous or heterogeneous? I'm going with homogeneous. Homogeneous? This is, this is definitely one of those ones where I could make the argument either way, right? It depends on how much sugar I added and did I give it a chance to dissolve all the way? And did I, or if you're using honey, then it has a tendency to settle to the bottom anyway, right? So you finish your cup of tea and then you still have all that honey at the bottom. Um, so it depends on what scale we're looking at a little bit and how well mixed it is. Um, and on, a, on something like, if I was asking a question like this on a test, I'm less interested in, did you pick A or B? And more interested in, can you explain why you said homogenous? Or why did you pick heterogeneous? Um, I have an, I, a, an answer in mind when I write the questions, but that's not necessarily the only answer. I love playing devil's advocate and just arguing with people and debating things in general. So I'm always up for you convincing me um, why a certain, a certain example is homogeneous or not. Right, so. Um, and that's just good practice on my tests in general. If you think you're maybe not understanding the question right, or if you are unsure, but you think it's one way, answer it, give me your logic for it. And at the very least, that means I can give you more partial credit, even if it's not full credit. Um, you know, I think you meant to write this if you found a typo, for instance. So I'm going to answer the question that way. Or um, you said T, and here's why I think T is homogenous. Because the tea at the, the last sip of tea tastes the same as the first sip of tea might actually be a good answer for, for why you think it's homogenous. But if you're making your tea and it's the last sip is sweeter than the first sip, then maybe it's not homogenous. Maybe it's heterogeneous, and you could explain it that way. All right. so. Here's sort of a flow chart covering the, the vocab we've talked about for the for matter so far. So everything is matter. Everything has mass and occupies volume. Well, everything we're talking about in this class. Um, if you want to talk to the philosophers about whether or not knowledge is matter, um, or you might have to talk to the neuroscientists about how how information storage in the brain works to determine whether or not an idea is matter. Um, but for this class, we're going to leave such complicated topics alone for now. Um, everything is going to have going to fall into one of two categories. It's either a pure substance or it's a mixture. So are the properties and composition constant is the key there. <laughs> 
meaning it doesn't, you don't have to specify a concentration. If I say, here's some water, you don't have to say, okay, what's, you know, how strong is this water? It's water. It is what it is. It's always got the same properties. Um, and it's always the same ratio of hydrogen to oxygen. If the, con if the properties can vary, for instance, salinity, seawater would be an, a good case for, you know, different places are going to have different salinity levels in the seawater. That's a good indicator that it's a mixture. Um, mayonnaise milk actually is actually a, a mixture, is a mixture of various things. Anything where it's going to have more than one ingredient on your nutrition label um, is going to be a mixture. Um, most rocks are also mixtures, especially the kind of rocks we have around here. Granite, you can look at granite, you can actually see that you've got different sort of grains, right? Different materials that are mixed together to make these rocks. Um, within pure substances, you're either going to have an element. If it's a pure substance, it's made of only one element. It's an element. It's that's we call that elemental whatever elemental iron elemental oxygen elemental nitrogen. Um, if it's something that is made of more than one element, it's a chemical compound. So, water, um, depending on you know certain minerals are going to be elements, and other minerals will be chemical compounds. If you find mineral that's um, metallic copper, that's a pure element. If you're mining and you find I an iron oxide ore, that's going to be a chemical compound. So water, sugar, table salt um, are all going to be examples of chemical compounds. Um, Within mixtures, as we just talked about, you've got homogeneous versus heterogeneous. And almost everything, if you zoom in far enough, is going to be a heterogeneous mixture. So as long as you are ready to explain why something is not completely evenly mixed, heterogeneous is usually your best bet. Um, for instance, um, so we talked about seawater. Um, and the fact that seawater in, in our oceans has different salinity, depending on if you're in the Pacific Ocean, um, North Pacific versus the South Pacific, you're going to have different mineral concentrations dissolved in the seawater is a, is a way of, of saying that it's a heterogeneous mixture. Um, and so it, it does actually, the difference between these a little bit does depend a little bit on sig figs. How much do you care about that salinity level? If you can just say, well, it has salt in both places, therefore I'm gonna say that it's homogenous. It comes down to what is your precision sometimes. Um, the other thing on this chart that I wanna look at is this physical versus a chemical change. So physical changes are any time where you're not changing the identity of a compound, you're just changing the state. So for instance, separating the salt from seawater, it's still salt. It was just either dissolved in water or it's not dissolved in water. That would be an example of a physical change. You take salt water and you turn it into pure water and pure salt. That's a physical change. Um, if you're actually changing what atoms are bound together, for instance, going from an element to a chemical compound is a chemical change. Basically, if you're changing where the electrons are, anytime something is changing charge, that's gonna be a chemical change. So for instance, if we took iron oxide out of the ground, that's a physical change. It was buried in the ground, and now we have iron oxide that's, that's pure iron oxide. That's a physical change. If we then took that iron oxide and we turned it into pure iron, metallic iron, that's a chemical change. Because we have to change the charge on the iron to do that. 
All right, so that'll make more sense too when we start talking about classic classes of, of chemical reactions. Um, but just in the context of talking about types of matter, it also makes sense to continue to think about types of change. So let's do practice with that. Um, for each of these situations, describe it as a physical change. Is it a physical change or a chemical change? I'll give you a second to get started on this and we'll talk about them. So you cut a pizza. Is that a physical change to the pizza or a chemical change? Physical. Physical. Yeah, we can't really uncut a pizza, but at the same time, it's still pizza. We didn't change what it was. We didn't change um, anything about the pizza. We just took it and put it in smaller pieces. Burning a candle. Would that be both? Maybe. Why do you why do you say that, Gina? Well, it's actually manipulating the physical form of the candle by like melting and then you know exposing the wick. And then burning would be changing the wick and wax into smoke. So you're correct. You could say it's both. If we wanted to talk about a candle going through just a physical change, that would be like if you leave your candles in your garage over the summer and they melt and they melt and they wind up all drooped over. That would be a physical change. You didn't actually burn anything. You could remelt those and straighten them out and you still have everything exactly as it was. But the fact if you actually burn the wick, you can't unburn the wick, right? Right. So you're taking the wick and most of the wax, most of the wax when you burn a candle, kind of, it disappears. It's not really just evaporating, it's actually being burned and turning into CO2 and smoke. So that part is a chemical change. Anytime something is burning, that's, that's a key word that show, tells you it's gonna be a chemical change. I just said melting wax, that'd be a physical change. Okay. So toasting a marshmallow. Toasting. Well, what's the logical extension? Exactly. What's the logical extension of toasting? Would be if you're if you're like me, that means burning a marshmallow, right? Um, most people, when you cook marshmallows, that's either on purpose or not. Um, so, and once you have a toasted marshmallow, you can't go back to an untoasted marshmallow. Uh, dry ice melting. You got vote for physical. Yeah, I say physical too. Yeah, melting is another one of those key words. Anytime you hear a word that we associate with a phase change, so freezing, melting, um, evaporating, condensing, depositing, sublimating, anytime you see a phase change verb, that's gonna be a physical change. And that's actually how you make dry ice in the first place is, is undoing this process. You actually, if you have pure CO2 and you put it in a high pressure situation, situation's the wrong word, system, a high pressure situation would be like taking a test, right? Um, and a, a high pressure system, um, that's, it actually will, you can force liquid or gaseous CO2 into dry ice and you have solid CO2. So the fact that we can undo it without changing anything tells us it's a physical change. Dissolving sugar. Well, a question about the dry ice. So yeah. if, it, if it melts and nothing changes, but you need a system to put it back 
into dry ice form is that physical still it it is big so it in the context of everyday life, we think about dry ice melting and the CO2 escapes and there's nothing we can do about it, right? But if you think about putting CO2 in an empty vacuum and letting it turn into CO2 gas, all you would have to do to turn it back to CO2 would then be push on it like a piston and you go back to solid CO2. So it's it, the only reason it seems like it's non-reversible to us in everyday life is because we don't usually capture the CO2 from the dry ice as it evaporates. Um, or actually not evaporates, dry ice doesn't evaporate, it sublimates would be the better word because it's going straight from a solid to a gas. Um, dissolving sugar, I got to vote for physical. You can undo that, right? You let the water evaporate, you get something at least close to sugar back out of it it might be sort of syrupy still at the end but um, it's still sugar um you didn't really change the composition of it iron rusting in an old car chemical chemical i had two votes for chemical one for physical yeah you can if, if you apply enough voltage, you can undo oxidation on a car. But for the most part, when the car rusts out, you got it, you're better off cutting out the metal and putting new metal in uh, or replacing the panels um, because you're actually taking iron metal and you're converting it to iron oxide. So rust, just like burning or toasting, rust or oxidizing is another key word that tells us it's chemical. Um, iron or copper oxidizing to make that that green blue patina um, is a or anything tarnishing is another chemical change like silver tarnishes right um, that's an that's another case of that's just basically the term that's specific to silver that means the same thing as rusting silver tarnish is silver rust it just ma makes something that's a different color than iron oxide it silver oxide is black so that's why you got kind of that black coating on the outside um ice melting in the street physical chemical physical physical um yeah, so ice melting again melting is another one of our keywords and think and you think about if the ice in the street melts and then it gets cold again overnight it turns back to being ice right so it's definitely a reversible process. Let's see what about cast iron pot that is rust and you clean it and the rust is gone good question, so if you take a piece of metal that's oxidized. If you put it in the right situation, you can either get the oxide to scrub off, which is actually a physical change where you're physically scrubbing the oxide off the surface. Um, or if you actually use certain compounds like silver polish actually has is basically a paste of zinc uh, um, metal and zinc it oxidizes much more rapidly than silver does and so it'll actually take the silver oxide and turn it back to being silver um metal so there are certain processes where you can actually have your rusted or your tarnished metal and have it go through a reverse that chemical change and that'd be a second chemical change you went from silver metal to silver oxide and now you're going silver oxide back to silver metal so the whole idea that it, if it's reversible it must be physical doesn't really hold up it's when we get into it it winds up being better to talk about did you change the charge of something because that's your your stone cold smoking gun giveaway if you change the charge on any atoms by definition it's a chemical change um and so that's if you're cleaning something that's rusted by just scrubbing off the rusted part that's a physical change but if you're actually using a product to cause it to um, unoxidized, call that re um, reducing the metal, then that'd be a second chemical reaction. Last but not least, propane burning, 
chemical. chemical. Yeah. Again, burning, toasting. Um, most anytime you have a cooking term being used, um, that's going to be a chemical change. Searing, even, you could say is a chemical change. All right. So these are not too tricky, right? I mean, and again, it gets a little bit hazy right at the boundary. And so this is just like heterogeneous versus homogeneous. On a test, if you are unsure whether or not the change is physical versus chemical, explain your logic. Um, you know, for instance, I could make the argument that dissolving sugar is a chemical change because I know enough about sugar dissolving that I can say, well, if you're dissolving sugar into an acidic solution, then you're actually taking sucrose and you're splitting it up into glucose and fructose, and that's a chemical change. You guys might not know that, so on the surface, saying it's a physical change is good enough. But again, if you zoom in enough, if you know enough about a system, it does get a little bit hazy. What exactly is the difference between chemical and physical changes? And that's why um, that if a charge changes, is a really good metric because that's not really up for debate. All right, so let's do one more of these before we take a break and then we'll come back and we'll talk about electrons. If we take water and we hook it up to a car battery, we can make oxygen gas and hydrogen gas. Is that a physical change or chemical? Physical. Physical? I'm going with chemical because you're changing the charge. We're changing the charge. We're changing it from being from from every oxygen has two hydrogens to separating the oxygen atoms and from the hydrogen atoms. So we're breaking apart the molecule that was there and we're making two different molecules instead. So this is a good example of a chemical change but it's also reversible. If you take oxygen gas and hydrogen gas and you add a spark, they react very, very violently to turn back into water. Um, and if you have a large enough container of hydrogen that's going through that process, you could call it something like the Hindenburg. Um, the Hindenburg was a, was a Zeppelin or a blimp from the early 1900s that, that uh, had a hydrogen leak from inside it, and there was a spark where the hydrogen and, the ox and oxygen from the atmosphere were mixed together. And the whole thing went up in smoke, well, literally. And um, you know, if you've ever heard that, oh, the humanity um, expression when from a commentator or something like that, that's actually a reference to this actually happened. This disaster happened live um, on, on uh, radio. I don't believe they had it television at the time but there's recordings of of the video happening um along with the radio of the announcer who was who was narrating what was happening um so this would the fact that we're breaking up the molecules into something that's not that doesn't have hydrogen and oxygen anymore that we in fact we had to break the molecules up to do it tells us it's a chemical change All right, and with that, before we start talking about Mendeleev, um, let's take a 10 minute break. Let's come back at 2.30 and we'll talk about electrons in the periodic table. <laughs> 
All right, let's start coming on back here. Um, and we're going to talk about some some things that will probably answer some other questions that uh, that I heard on the on the quiz about um, how do we know that charge exists? How do we know if something's a positive charge or a negative charge? Um, <clears throat> You know, it, and we're gonna, I'm gonna present it as sort of the, give you the historical background again, because I think that that helps really um, reinforce exactly why things behave the way they do and, and um, why we do things like structure the periodic table with the shape that it has. Um, so Dmitry Mendeleev was a, was a Russian chemist in, uh, in the 1800s. Um, and this here's one of the few pictures uh, that we have of him. He was, you know, before most uh, before pictures were common, um, before photographs anyway were common. So all of his pictures, he looks sort of um, unhinged, um, like a lot of old photographs. Um, and he he has a very kind of a fascinating life story. Uh, in that his his life story is sort of like a a Russian tragedy. Um, it looks it's like a Tolstoy novel. Uh, he was born the youngest of, I want to say, 17 kids. Um, he had 16 older brothers and sisters, uh, although that, that number differs depending on what source you use. Some reports say he was the youngest of 19. Um, and into a fairly middle class family because his, um, his father was a, uh, an, in, a literature um, professor at, uh, at a university in, I want to say, Leningrad. Um, but right after he was born, his father went blind. And you can't, in the 1800s, you couldn't really teach literature if you couldn't read or see things. So his father lost his job. His mother had to go to work in a factory um, that her family owned. So was, they were still able to support the family for a while until the factory burned down a year later. Um, so in the space of a year and a half, the young, the baby of the family goes from middle class to no money whatsoever. Um, and, uh, they wound up having to move all the way across the country, um, so that, uh, his mother could find work at another family business in another city, uh, in Russia. Um, and so all that's, all that to say is he had a, a rough childhood and by all accounts made him a pretty bitter person. He was not very well liked. Um, and, and in fact, this is the person that literally invented the periodic table. Um, and he didn't even get an element named after himself until he'd been dead for over a hundred years. Um, because apparently that's how long it took everybody to forget just what a dick he was. Um, he was very, very notorious for like torpedoing other people's careers and squashing, you know, his, his, uh, colleagues. Um, at the uh, at the same university and at other universities, um, but he was undeniably brilliant. And his number one contribution um, to science was that he realized that if you if you list elements by their size uh, according to what the the atomic mass number was for these different elements, certain patterns showed up. So, for instance, you notice every eight elements you wound up with elements that had very similar properties. Hydrogen has similar properties to fluorine, has similar properties to chlorine, and so on. And then helium is similar to neon, is similar to argon. So typically before this, um, elements were either listed in tables, but they were either listed according to what year they were discovered, um, so chronologically, or they were listed alphabetically. It wasn't until Mendeleev that they tried listing them according to their properties instead. Uh, and so when he arranged them into a table and he put elements that had similar properties into columns, he noticed that there was some there was repetitive structure to the periodic table. And there, what's more is he noticed that there were gaps. So this is one of the older ones. This was actually not one of Mendeleev's. I believe this is some um, an Italian scientist. Um, who, who wrote this one up. Um, but basically, they were able to say, you know, and it, it still doesn't look much like the periodic table we think of it today, um, but that there were certain spots that an element should exist that they didn't know about yet. 
And so this actually allowed them to start looking more carefully. And actually they were able to find a lot of elements um, that they didn't know were there, that they had already found, but they were usually present in such small amounts that they, they weren't aware of it. Um, so for instance, scandium, gallium, and germanium all were predicted by Mendeleev's first periodic tables and were unknown at the time. And the, the very name germanium is another piece of evidence that Mendeleev was very, very um, unliked um, because germanium was one that Mendeleev himself predicted should exist and participated in isolating it. Um, and if you don't know your history, Russia and Germany in the late 1800s really didn't like each other. Um, so the fact that, that this element that Mendeleev played a hand in discovering um, was named germanium was like a direct screw you to Mendeleev. That was very carefully chosen by the international community of chemists to say, yeah, we know you helped find this Mendeleev, but we really don't like you. Um, so I, I think of that every time I see germanium, um, just reminds you that scientists, brilliant scientists are still people too and not necessarily likable people. Um, the reason, so Mendeleev's um, thought process going into this was sort of a scientific law. He noticed that these properties existed, so he was able to make this early version of the periodic table um, to mimic what he saw happening in nature, but it didn't explain anything. And so they, they weren't able to really explain why this happened until they started talking about electrons. And so this was about 40 years later when they started getting into um, quantum mechanics and they were starting to, to see how electrons behaved, they were able to start explaining that the reason you have these distinct rows of the periodic table and that they repeated in similar properties every row was because the electrons were arranged in these, what they referred to as energy levels. And as you added electrons into an energy level, it started behaving like the energy level above it on the periodic table it would be the lower energy level. Um, so this led to one of my favorite um, periods in science history, partly because we know a lot about it and we know a lot of the major players. Um, but this is one of the, the most, um, the coolest pictures ever, because this really explains why the 20th century was so different than um, historically than everything that had come before. Um, this picture was taken at a conference in, I want to say 1927, um, in uh, Belgium, in a place called Solvay. Um, and in this picture, there's, I want to say, there's 19 Nobel Prizes in this picture. Um, this is literally the first time in history that the leading minds from in one field from everywhere around the, the globe were gathered together physically in one place. Prior to this, people conducted scientific research by sending, sending uh, letters to each other, and it might be six months before you got a letter back. Um, so this was one of the first times in history where we actually were able to have the real-time face-to-face discussion of some of these really, really complex topics. Um, so all the names in, in uh, this was not originally a color photo. Somebody went back and colorized it, um, but I think it looks good enough colorized that I wanted to leave it that way. Um, the, um, all the names in bold um, won Nobel Prizes. Um, and if they have a dotted line around them, then that means that their students won a Nobel Prize. Um, so, and when you just, when you look at some of the names here, you had Einstein, you had Marie Curie, um, might not know who he is, but Lorenz, this fellow next to Marie Curie, um, had a romantic relationship with Marie Curie after her husband died. And he was actually one of the most famous mathematicians of all time. Um, he was so good at math that he won a physics Nobel Prize just because some of his math got used in somebody else's physics. Um, and let's see, you got all of the the classic um, quantum quantum mechanics names. Heisenberg in particular is really funny to me because he looks he just every picture I've ever seen of Heisenberg he looks like a creeper. He kind of has that sort of weird um, weird look that looks like you can't really trust him. Um, 
And then there's is that, also is that Schrodinger is still the Schrod is that the Schrodinger cat guy? Yeah, that's Schrodinger of Schrodinger's cat, um, and Schrodinger equation. Um, and in particular, this one off to the right. Let me change the color here. Um, all the ones in that have boxes in red won Nobel prizes in physics, and green was Nobel prizes in chemistry. Um, Marie Curie be the one person who won Nobel prize in both fields. Um, for her work on determining what radioactivity was, won her a physics Nobel Prize, and then she discovered three elements in her lifetime, um, which, um, which is why she won a Nobel Prize in chemistry as well. Um, she also has a fascinating life story. Her One of her daughters shared a Nobel Prize with her, and her other daughter um, was a journalist who fought in the, um, for the French um, resistance during World War II um, before going on to become a really important part of the UN after World War II. Um, this fellow in blue that I circled is Niels Bohr. And Niels Bohr is one of my favorites because he was very vocal in disagreeing with Einstein. Um, all of the, the funny quips that you've heard of Einstein, um, Niels Bohr was the one who was arguing with him and telling Einstein that he was wrong. Um, for instance, the, the classic Einstein quote is, you know, God does not play with dice, which is argument for why quantum mechanics couldn't be true, because he didn't like the idea that the universe was based on probability and random chance. And Niels Bohr was the one who's, whose response was, Einstein quit telling God what to do. Um, and so it's, you know, this is such a, a really fascinating picture to me for that reason. And you see sort of some of the relationships as well like Polly and Heisenberg, Polly is this one, um, worked together on everything. They're about the same age. They lived in different countries, but they collaborated on everything. And I want to say that they even shared their Nobel Prize uh, as well. Um, and the ones that didn't win a Nobel Prize still wound up with units named after them. Um, for instance, a Dubai is a unit of charge. Um, a Langevin is a unit that has to do with voltage. Um, at the at the quantum level, um, so it's uh, it's fascinating to to look at this picture to me at least. Um, clearly, I can spend all day talking about it, um, and it really does paint a picture for how transmitting ideas and communication and travel becoming easier in the 20th century made a lot of the advances we've made in the 20th century possible. The reason it's happening so quickly is because of travel and information flow being so quick, at least compared to historically. And so for just to introduce quantum mechanics, um, there are lots of quotes like this. This one was said by Niels Bohr, which is why I like, I like to use this one. Um, Those who are not shocked when they first come across quantum theory cannot possibly have understood it. Um, it's very non-intuitive. We're going to talk, cover it at a conceptual level. Um, I'm not going to have you do any of the math for quantum mechanics because it's way beyond what we do in this class. You have to have had linear algebra and be able to do um, partial derivatives, which is third, third year calc um, in matrices uh, in order to do some of this math. We don't even do it by hand anymore at all. We do it all using computers to approximate things. Um, but conceptually, even the concepts are counterintuitive in a lot of ways. Right. So basically, one of the things that led to, to quantum mechanics being discovered, and so this is happening sort of parallel to Mendeleev designing the periodic table and that becoming co um, common, commonly used, um, is they were figuring out that certain particles actually behaved like waves. Traditionally, things were thought of as it's either a particle or it's a wave. And you had to sort of pick one or the other. Um, well, Max Planck and several, several of the other founders of quantum mechanics basically discovered that if you get small enough, things behave like both a particle and a wave. Something could have a mass, but still have a wave in terms of um, how it how it behaves and relative to light. So, and they wound up discovering that these these certain particles, when you got small enough, and we're talking about things that are about the size of an electron, so we're talking about things that are two thousand times smaller than the nucleus of a hydrogen atom. Um, 
they could only have certain energies. In other words, we it wasn't possible to just have any energy. You could only have this energy or that energy. Energy one or energy two, you couldn't have energy 1.5. You couldn't be halfway in between these two states. And so that it behaved kind of like a guitar string vibrating. If you think about um, a guitar string vibrating or any stringed instrument, take your stringed instrument of choice, you're gonna have what's called a standing wave where the, the string vibrates back and forth. It's connected at each end of the string, but when you pluck the string, it vibrates back and forth. Um, however, you can have different energy levels. You can have different waves on these strings. For instance, if you put your finger exactly halfway on, um, between the two ends of a guitar string, you can actually cause it to vibrate um, in a different way. And so it still looks like a wave. It still looks like a sine wave um, where both ends are connected. But this is going to be a different frequency of sound that it produces because it's a different wavelength. The distance that this vibration is happening over is different, even though the two ends are connected at the same place. And if you put your finger exactly a third of the way along a guitar string, you can make it vibrate differently. And you can cause these different vibrations based on the different possible waves. The thing is, you can't be in between these two. You, these, if you look at these two um, samples on the left, you can't have anything that's in between these two wavelengths. Because if you did that, then one of the two ends of the string wouldn't be connected. It would, you would wind up with one end of the wave being up here instead of down at the bottom where it's fixed, where it's fastened. So they started seeing that there were a lot of similarities in terms of how electrons behaved to these harmonic vibrations. So if you if you play an instrument, these are what are known as harmonics. Um, and so if anytime you're playing harmonics on a stringed instrument, you're basically picking which wavelength you're using, which oscillation you're using, and that changes the frequency of the of the note. The shorter wavelength means higher energy. So you could be, your lowest possible energy would be if the string is just vibrating and you have half of a wave between point A and point B. If you cut that distance in half, if you cut the wavelength in half, you get a full wave, an up and a down before you get to the other side. That's a shorter wavelength, which means it's a higher frequency. And same here, we have an even shorter wavelength. It's one and a half waves between the both ends of the string. Uh, and that's going to affect the, the energy of that system. And so the reason that we only that we have this repetitive structure of the periodic table is because electrons behave in these predictable systematic ways when it comes to these are the possible energies you can have. And so as you start adding electrons to a system, you start by putting them into the lowest energy system, which we call the lowest energy level, um, which we call energy level one or N equals one. And once you fill that up, you can start moving electrons to a higher energy level. And that process starts repeating itself. So you fill up energy level one, then you start putting electrons into energy level two. And then once energy level two fills up, you start adding electrons into energy level three. And each of these individual energy levels behaves in a way that's very similar to the level before it. Any, any atom that you have that has a full outer energy level is going to behave like a noble gas, every, which is why they're grouped on the right-hand side of the periodic table is because they all have a similar electron configuration. The electrons are all set up in more or less the same way. Um, and it's sort of like, it's sort of like filling up a bookcase. If you want to fill up a bookcase with books, um, and you want it to be as low energy as possible, so you're less likely for it to fall over and, and, uh, break things, you fill a books, bookshelf from the bottom up, right? You don't fill, if you were worried about a bookshelf falling over, you don't fill it 
the top level first, right? You fill from the lowest energy state. And as you fill the lower energy state, you go up to the next level. And once you fill up that level, you go to the next level. And so we can sort of think of these as being analogous to a bookshelf. You're filling up N equals one, the lowest energy level first, and then you fill up energy level two, and then you fill up energy level three. I've never actually stopped to look at this figure that has, I have no idea what these, uh, I'm guessing these are jokes, um, the titles of the books. Um, I don't get the references though, maybe you guys will. Um, and this is related to those, those vibrations in that you can't have these electrons in an energy level where the two ends of the string, so to speak, don't connect with each other. The same way that the guitar string had to be either this wavelength or this wavelength, and it couldn't be anything in between. Electrons behave the same way. It has to be either n equals one or n equals two. It can't be in between those two levels, um, which leads to some interesting things. And this is part of what Niels Bohr was talking about when he said that it was so shocking, is that electrons, if electrons, they literally cannot exist in between these two states. So this is where the bookshelf analogy sort of breaks down. You could take out a book out of the bottom bookshelf and hold it halfway up to the next bookshelf, right? The book still exists when you, if you, you know, when you grab the book from the bottom bookshelf and move it up to the third level, it still exists that whole time. Electrons don't behave that way. Electrons can literally only exist at certain energy levels, which means they kind of teleport, for lack of a better term. They don't. You don't move an electron from one energy level to another. It ceases to exist at one energy level and then starts existing at the other energy level, which is weird, which is counterintuitive and doesn't be, it's not like how regular things behave. Um, so as we are filling up these energy levels, we're getting higher and higher energy. And basically the, the nice thing about quantum is that once we learn the rules, they just like any other physical rule, they behave the same way every time. It's all about if you have a certain number of electrons, you start putting them at the low energy state and you just add electrons until you get to the highest energy state, uh, until you run out of electrons. All right, so here's a slide that's a sort of about what I was talking about as far as electrons ceasing to exist at one energy level and then starting to exist at another energy level. Um, you, that doesn't just spontaneously happen. You have to add energy into the system to get that to do that. And so then the most common way of doing that is by shining light on it. If you shine light of a certain wavelength, well, that light is carrying energy with it. And so you can actually shine light on a low energy electron and it promotes the electron to a higher energy level. And when it does that, the, that light, that photon actually ceases to exist. It actually, that light is fully absorbed and it just disappears. Which also seems counterintuitive, right? Conservation of mass says that mass is not supposed to just disappear. Um, but that doesn't apply in the case of light. Light behaves differently than normal matter. Um, and if you have a bigger energy gap between your energy levels, then it takes a different wavelength of light to get that electron to be promoted. Um, this is the basic principle that, that solar cells work on. Solar cells absorb photons from the sun and they promote electrons when they do that. And those high energy electrons can then be hooked up to a circuit and used as, as current. Um, on the other hand, the exact opposite, when something relaxes, when an electron relaxes, that's when it starts at a high energy and drops down to a lower energy, but it doesn't, you're not actually taking that same electron and moving it from here to here, 
it's ceasing to exist at the high energy level and starts to exist at the lower energy level, but that energy has to go somewhere. And so it'll actually create a photon out of nothing as a way of getting rid of the extra energy. So when you have something that's going from high energy to low energy in, in terms of electrons, in terms of energy levels, it generates light. It creates light. So this is actually how LEDs work. An LED is literally the exact opposite of, of solar cell. A solar cell takes light and turns it into electricity. LEDs take electricity and turn it into light. A LED starts by using electricity to move an electron up to a higher energy level. And then when it falls down, it creates a photon. And by controlling these two energy levels, how far apart these energy levels are, that's going to control what wavelength of light is given off. That's why some LED lights are you know, more white or bluish, and others are more yellow or red, is based on how far apart these energy levels are. And that also is, is one of the ways that we study astronomy uh, and how we know how, how certain um, planets, what certain planets are made out of, or other stars are made out of, despite the fact we can't actually go take a sample and bring it back to test it. But what we can do is we can look at the light that those stars give off. And if you take the light of various elements when, it, when they're heated up and you put it through a prism, we get something that looks almost like a barcode. And every element and every compound is going to have a unique barcode. We call it emission spectrum. Um, that's going to allow us to determine what that specific element is or what elements are present. If you have a, a um, barium sample and you heat it up, and it, it's going to glow green. But when you split that through a prism, you actually get something that looks like a rainbow colored barcode. All right, so this is all partly to show that despite how weird quantum is, we actually have very good evidence to show that, that this is how it behaves because otherwise we should see something that looks more like a traditional rainbow, for instance, for barium, where you would see more of a spectrum of the colors. But the fact that we see these really discrete, distinct lines tells us that those are the only wavelengths of light that electrons can make when you move from one energy level to another. Right? So, so despite how non-intuitive, counterintuitive it is, um, we actually have very good experimental evidence for quantum mechanics. Um, and so we won't go into too much detail as to the math that predicts these things. Um, but we will talk about how the electrons can behave and how that ties to the periodic table. So it turns out we don't have just energy levels. It's not just one shelf. They're actually sort of subdivisions of each shelf within that, that analogy. Um, and this is going to be tied to, again, the shape of that periodic table. Um, as you start adding electrons into a system, you're going to start by filling up the first energy level. And the first energy level we denote with this capital or with this one. And then the type of orbital we write after that. And so that's saying that's an S-type orbital. An S orbital can only hold a to total of two electrons. And so we, we would write that first energy level. We'd say first energy level, S orbital, and we're going to add two electrons. And once that one S orbital has been filled up, we have to go to the next energy level. All right. So this ties to the periodic table because... Where are my periodic tables here? 
Um, this ties to the periodic table because if you look at the first row of the periodic table, it only has two elements in it, hydrogen, then helium. In fact, it barely looks like a row, but that first row of the periodic table, this is the first energy level when you're adding electrons is just n equals one, it can only hold two electrons. And once you fill up that first energy level, if you add any more electrons, you have to go to a second energy level. So the row on the periodic table actually tells you what energy level you're adding electrons into. So for lithium, we have a total of three electrons for lithium when it's neutral. So if we wanted to know what energy level those electrons were in, we would say, okay, the first two electrons go into the, the first energy level, into that 1s orbital. So we say, if I go back to the slides here, that's what this electron configuration is showing. Is that the first and the first two electrons are going into first energy level into an s orbital, and there's two of them. Then the next energy level is energy level two. So lithium has a total of three electrons. Two of them are in the 1s orbital. And then the last electron is going into the 2s orbital. Right? And so the, the, again, the periodic table has this information built into it if you know how to look at it. If you look at the bottom of the periodic tables that I have you guys um, using, they're, the sections of the periodic table are broken up into S block, P block, D block. And that's telling you, if, if you're counting along with, with the atomic numbers, when you're counting along the S block, that's equivalent to adding electrons into an S orbital. And if it's the second row of the periodic table, that's the 2S orbital. And then once you fill up the 2s orbital, we still have more atoms, more elements in this second row. So after you fill up the 2s orbital, you go to the 2p orbital. This right-hand section is called the p block. And so that you would go, if we wanted to write the electron configuration, say for nitrogen, we would count along with the periodic table. And it's always going to go in the same order. You start by adding electrons into the first energy level, and it's always an s orbital. So you always start with 1s2. Then you've filled up the first energy level. Then you're, if we're going again, if we're trying to figure out the electron configuration for nitrogen, we have a total of seven electrons. So after we fill up the 1s orbital, we have to fill up the 2s orbital, and that takes another two electrons. So our electron configuration would be 1s2, 2s2. And now we're still in the second energy level, but we're in a p orbital. So it'd be 2p. And to get to nitrogen that we have to count, we have to add three more electrons in. So it'd be 2p3. Right? And so if I, I know that that was quick and we're gonna do lots more practice for this, but if you look at these diagrams of the orbitals, we're adding two electrons into each of these boxes. Um, and basically we're just adding one electron in the exponent for each of these, for each of these elements. So lithium is 1s2, 2s1. Beryllium is 1s2, 2s2, total of four electrons. And it, the logic is the same. You're going to start by filling up the lowest energy orbitals, which is always 1s, and then 2s, and then you go to 2p, and then you go to 3s, and then you go to 3p, and then things start getting a little bit weird, but we'll get to that in a second. All right. So the 
this is exactly why the periodic table has the shape it does, why you wind up with those repetitive elements in the same column, because it corresponds with this right-hand column, column 18, they all behave the same way because they all have a full energy level. You've gotten, you've added enough electrons for each of these that you filled that outermost energy level, which makes them very, very stable. Column 17, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, they're all one electron away from being full. They all need to gain one electron to look like a noble gas. So everything in column 17 will become more stable if it has a negative one charge, because that'll allow it to look like a noble gas. It'll have the same number of electrons as a noble gas then, and it'll have the same electron configuration as a noble gas. Right? So electron configuration allows us to predict and explain why the periodic table looks like it does. So oxygen is not on our list here, but if we can extrapolate what's what is uh, written here in this, this column um, right here, this is the shorthand for showing the electron configuration. So the large number indicates the energy level. The italicized letter indicates the type of the orbital. And the, sub, the superscript is not saying squared. That's just saying that's how many electrons are in that orbital. Right, so this electron configuration matches up exactly with the diagram here, but we're not going to, but it's a lot easier to write electron configuration as a shorthand. So what would it look like for oxygen? Oxygen is over here on the periodic table. So it has a total of eight electrons when it's neutral. What would the electron configuration for oxygen look like? Give that a try and then I'll write it on the board. All right, I'm going to take the periodic table off the screen so people on the recording can see what me right on the board. All of these electron configurations start the same way. We're always filling in the most, the lowest energy orbitals first, and the order of those orbitals doesn't really change. So if we have a total of, so oxygen, a total of eight electrons total. We need eight electrons in our electron configuration. So we start with energy level one. And the first type of orbital that we have, if we're following along on the periodic table, hydrogen is in an S orbital. So it's energy level one, orbital type S. And in S, the S block is two elements wide. So that tells us that an S orbital can hold two electrons. So our first two electrons for oxygen, we write 1s2. Then we finish the first row of the periodic table. So now we're on the second energy level. So energy level two. If, you, if you're following along, lithium and beryllium, three and four are still in the S block. So we're still adding electrons into an S type orbital. And all S type orbitals can hold two electrons. So that's our first four electrons out of our eight for oxygen. So our last four electrons, we're following along after we 
count to four on the periodic table, we go to boron. Five, boron is number five, right? So it's in the still in the second row. But now we're in the P block. We're in the in a P orbital. And again, that's on the periodic table. That whole right-hand section is um, comprised of a p orbital. And so, and if we look at how wide that section is on the periodic table, it's six elements across. So we could add a total of six electrons into a p orbital. We only need four more. So our electron configuration for oxygen would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. All right, and it's always going to go in the same order for this class. There are some very odd exceptions to that that we'll get into in Gen Chem. Um, but all you have to do to write these is to be able to follow along the periodic table. Start counting at one, and you count until you run out of electrons. The row on the periodic table tells you your energy level. Your block on the periodic table tells you what type of orbital you're filling up. And the width of that block tells you how many electrons it can fit. All right, so what would it look like for sulfur? So I'll put the periodic table back up here. Good, Brooke. Um, the peri so let me go back to the screen share. Sulfur is number 16. So when it's neutral, we need 16 electrons. Try and use the same rules we did to get oxygen to figure out what the electron configuration would look like for sulfur. All right, again, I'm going to minimize or I'm going to stop screen share. But if you have a periodic table printed out at home, then that's a good, a good thing to have for these. It's really the only tool you need for these. So sulfur is going to start out again. So everything starts out the same way. Always start out with 1s2, your first energy level. Starts with an s orbital that can only hold two electrons. And then you finish the first energy level. Now we go to the second energy level, which again starts in an s orbital. And it can fit two electrons in it. Now, if we jump to the other side of the second row. It's still the second energy level. But now we're in the P block that can hold a total of six electrons. That's why it's six elements across. So 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Now we finish the second energy level. So now we're in the third energy level, but we're back in the s block. 
So it's 3s, and it can hold two electrons. And the other reason the periodic table is so useful for this, you just count till we get to sulfur. We don't even really need to count the electrons as long as it's neutral. If it's a neutral atom, you just count till you get to sulfur. So we're, once we fill up 3s, we're still in the third energy level. Now we're in the P block. And we need another four electrons to get to sulfur. So the full electron configuration for sulfur would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p4. And this section here, that looks really similar to the end of oxygen, right? Oxygen ended in 2s2, 2p4. Sulfur ends in 3s2, 3p4. Whatever is underneath sulfur, which is blanking off selenium, is going to end in 4s2, 4p4. So the whole reason that we have those repeating columns in the periodic table is because those are the elements that have similar electron configurations. And it allows us to predict things like what the charge is going to be on those. Sulfur and oxygen both become more stable if they can gain two more electrons, and then they would look like a noble gas. So sulfur and oxygen both become more stable with a negative two charge when they have two extra electrons, because then, then they look just like that noble gas right next to them. They have the same electron configuration as argon and neon, right? So this is why the, the periodic table is, is a huge amount of information when you know how to read it properly. And one of those tools is knowing how to use it to make electron configurations and knowing why that matters. So Sean. Yes. That bold line separates the P block um, on that, you know, looker's right side as it, is almost. that right? Oh, almost. So let me, let me go back to the slides. Um, the P block is column 13 to column 18 all the time. That stair step line is telling you something else. Oh, so. If we just looked at the periodic table in terms of blocks, that line wouldn't be there. The line would be um, would be cutting straight down at column between column twelve and thirteen. This stair right. step line is actually um, the line between metals and nonmetals. Oh, everything okay. to the left of the stair step line is a metal. Everything to the right of that stair step line is a non-metal. Right. So it Got winds it. up being, it depends a little bit on what level you are on the periodic table, where you draw the line between a metal and a non-metal. And we'll talk about why that is in more detail on Wednesday. Um, the last, the last figure that I want to show you today is basically taking the periodic table and it's rewriting it as a graph where you're looking at energy. Which I'm using the wrong annotation tools. That's what I want. Um, energy is always gonna start by filling up the lowest energy orbitals first. So it's always gonna go in the same order because these orbitals only exist at certain energy levels. So it goes 1s, then it goes 2s, then it goes 2p, then it goes 3s, then it goes 3p. And then things start getting really a little bit messy because it turns out that there's actually a 3d orbital, but it's actually higher in energy than the 4s. So we finish the periodic on the periodic table we finish the third row of the periodic table but that's not actually filling up the third energy level completely we just kind of go back and we fill up 4s first and then we fill up 3d 
So this middle section here is called the is the D blocks, also known as the transition metals. Um, and actually, I've never made the connection for it. it might be considered transition metal because that's where you make the transition for it going very, very smoothly between um, energy level and row on the periodic table. 3D is actually part of the third energy level. Um, but you fill it up after 4S. And it's because of this, um, this graph that shows that the 3D orbitals are actually higher in energy than 4S. So this is actually a better way to think about how things are happening, but you won't always have this in front of you. You'll always have a periodic table in front of you. So I encourage you to learn how to use the periodic table to explain um, and to follow along with this. And I actually have a version of the periodic table that I've rearranged to be that same shape where you start at the bottom and count along. So 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2. And then you see that 20 jumps over to 21 over here is scandium. So that's that, that discontinuity where you fill up part of the fourth energy level before you finish filling up the third energy level. And so it's just that it makes writing those electron configurations that involve a d orbital a little bit trickier. And we'll practice with that on Wednesday. We'll start Wednesday with a bunch of practice for polyatomic ions, or sorry, for um, electron configurations. All right. So we've already done some of these. You could practice with the rest of these, um, and we'll go through them on Wednesday. Is this what the lab um, is today or, or this week? The lab will start getting into how electron configuration a little bit and sort of some of the various it, um, theories about how uh, electrons behave. Um, so it'll be more practice with some of these concepts, yes. Is that a labster? It is, an, it is another labster, um, but I will give a, a brief intro to it at the beginning. Um, just to to orient you guys, and it's not as in depth for this. this. Is this is all you need to start the homework? Some of the electron configurations, if they go past the third row on the periodic table, um, are going to be a little bit trickier until we get more practice. But the, um, a lot of the parts of the homework you can do with just the info from this lecture. Okie dokie. Thank you. All right. So I went a few minutes over. So let's take our full 10 minutes. If you have lab today, come back at, at 3.35 um, and we will we'll get started on that. Or you can start the Labster Lab whenever you want, um, since it should be live. Um, Sean, I'm in the middle of picking up my son from school. I'm going to be a yeah. little late to the lab. Yeah, no, no worries. I'll, I'll record it for you again. We might have to do the thing where I where I boot everybody from Zoom for a minute while it renders, um, but uh, make sure that you get access to that. And then I missed a little bit of this too while I was driving. Is there, how long does that take for this lecture to load? It'll probably be a, um, about an hour for it to finish rendering. And then I have to get it uploaded to YouTube and then YouTube has to render it. It's a, it's a process. It'll take about an hour, hour and a half um, for, for that link to go live. Thank you. Cool. No See you in lab. Yeah. Bye.